Okay, welcome back, everyone. Uh, the next speaker will be Gary Nemesh. Let me give you a little introduction to him because. <laughs> <laughs> Is that better? <laughs> so, so about an, an, a, so a bit more than a decade ago, one of my PhD students was at some point communi communicating with a PhD student from Budapest and who was working completely on his own. And when I started checking what he was doing, he was working on the gamma function, Stirling approximation, but he was producing super sharp error bounds that nobody has done before. and. and and the machinery that he was using was actually all based on the work by Michael Barry and Chris Howells, but somehow he created uh, the sharpest error bounds ever for all those special functions. We had error bounds before via the theory of uh, Frank Golver, and everyone was thinking that the theory of differential equation is far superior than the theory of integrals, but Gergo showed us that that's actually not the case. The, 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 the best methods to use is actually resurgence because all these integral representations that you can obtain by the work from Michael Barry and Chris Hultz, those are the ones that, you, uh, that inv um, have resurgence built into them. Afterwards, he kept on working in asymptotics, kept on uh, writing papers uh, with very sharp error bounds. People are actually implementing them now in many, many numerical packages as well. I was fortunate that he was also a postdoc with me for a couple of years, but then he disappeared. He didn't want to stay in Edinburgh. He went back to Budapest, but now he also like, likes to be in Japan, and unfortunately he can't be here today, but he can at least give a talk from Japan. So, Gergo, go ahead. Thank you very much, Andy, for the nice introduction.
stock signs uh, that alters the behavior of the <clears throat> stocks multipliers. The next question, natural question is, uh, if there is a very type smooth interpretation uh, of this uh, phenomena, uh, Barry remarks uh, in his paper about the gamma function that, um, uh, that the smoothing of uh, the Stokes phenomenon for the gamma function itself uh, has to be more elaborate uh, than that for the logarithm of the gamma function and one might have to use hyper asymptotics. And he was right, uh, that's uh, what we will uh, do indeed. Uh, yes, uh, let me mention that it is known that uh, the smooth interpretation of the uh, Leading uh, sub exponentials uh, follows the error function rule. This was shown first by uh, Boyd in 1994. Uh, and I will uh, reproduce uh, this result here so that uh, to help you understanding the hyperasymptotic uh, procedure. So we define uh, the remainder of this series after n terms, R and Z, and R tilde and Z. In this case, the numerical least term, uh, the index of the numerical least term is uh, about uh, two pi times z absolute value. And we expect that at optimal truncation, uh, the small exponentials, the leading ones should reveal themselves uh, in the remainder terms. So we must have these uh, approximate uh, equalities. I produced a plot for uh, the remainder of the reciprocal gamma. So I normalized the remainder with the expected exponential. I truncated the series optimally and uh, take the real part, the imaging part is negligible and plotted it in, in, the, in this uh, range. And this is what we get. Uh, so it seems that indeed it follows the error function law uh, so on the Stokes line, the value is a half, and then it quickly becomes a one. Uh, and to show this rigorously, uh, we can use hyperasymptotics. Um, and for that, uh, we need uh, representations uh, for the remainder term. Uh, here they are. Uh, these explicit representations are valid in this sector and for any n at least one, and these are due to Boyd from 1994. Um, and the idea of the procedure is that uh, we replace, uh, yeah, this is, uh, by the way, the resurgence phenomenon that the function itself reappears in its own, uh, in the remainder of its own asymptotic expansion. So we can substitute the asymptotic expansion into these integrals, integrate term by term. And that's how we uh, get the first level uh, hyperasymptotics. Now for hyperasymptotics, we need hyperterminants. Um, for the first level, we need the first hyperterminant. Uh, this is what I define here. So n uh, is a real number greater than one, sigma any element on the Riemann surface of the log. And the first hyperterminant is defined by this integral. Uh, provided that sigma times z uh, is on the principal sheet and by analytic continuation elsewhere. This function can be expressed uh, like this in terms of the uh, upper incomplete gamma function. Uh, and at optimal truncation, uh, hyperterminants will appear where the, this n parameter has the size about uh, z times sigma absolute value. So we need an asymptotic description of this uh, function in that case. And such a description by, was found by first by Barry uh, and then a slightly improved version by Olver a few years later. Uh, I'm quoting here uh, Olver's result. So we take the uh, F1 function, normalize it in a certain way uh, we assume that uh, n is about the size of sigma times z absolute value. Alpha here is a bounded quantity. Uh, there can be a bounded uh, perturbation here uh, by a positive non-negative integer n. 
and I will denote by phi the phase of sigma times z. Uh, then for large values of n or sigma times z, uh, this is the asymptotics of the function in this large sector. Uniformly with respect to the phase uh, and this alpha quantity, if it's bounded. And there is a C function, function of the phase appearing in the complementary error function, which is defined implicitly by this equation and it corresponds to the branch, uh, which has this behavior as uh, phi uh, approaches uh, pi. Uh, yes, I forgot the following uh, bingo. Okay, uh, so this is the formula that we will need. Uh, and here is the first level hyperasymptotics uh, after uh, substituting into the remainder formula. Uh, I assume that uh, we truncate the original series optimally. And then it can be shown that uh, if you take a bounded number of terms in the re-expansion involving the hyperterminants, uh, then we have these uh, estimates for the remainder of the remainder. And I will focus on the Stokes phenomenon on the positive imaginary axis. Uh, it is controlled by this hyperterminant, uh, for I colored it by uh, blue. Similar expansion for the remainder of the reciprocal gamma function. And at optimal truncation, we have these estimates uh, on the positive. Uh, imaging axis, this function will control the Stokes phenomenon. And after using uh, this approximation, uh, focusing locally on the neighborhood, in the neighborhood of the Stokes line, we can replace the C function by this approximation. Neglecting uh, error terms, uh, we end up with this uh, clean result. So we see that the Exponentials, the, the dominant uh, uh, sub exponentials multiplied by the first uh, few terms of the uh, asymptotic extension are switched on uh, by the complementary error function according to uh, Barry's law. Again, in this narrow parabolic shape region around the Stokes ray. Uh, so these exponentials follow Barry's uh, rule. Um, but uh, where do the next sub exponential, e to the plus minus four pi i z come from? Uh, the answer is not difficult. They must come from uh, the remainders of the remainders. Uh, so from this one and from the other one. But to see them, uh, we have to choose a different truncation scheme. So M has to be large as well turns out that m has to be about this size and n has to be about 4 pi times that absolute value. And to uh, see this graphically, uh, I plotted first the uh, remainder of the remainder in the gamma function case normalized by the exponential with this new optimal truncation in this phase range. And then you can see uh, that it is what we would expect. So this uh, value that uh, I showed you in the discontinuous treatment, three over eight appears on the Stokes line, and then the value quickly becomes about one. So this is exactly what was predicted by the discontinuous treatment. This is the picture for the reciprocal gamma function. So here uh, there is a value about one over eight on the Stokes line and then it becomes uh, quickly zero again. This is again in accordance uh, with the discontinuous treatment. Now the question is what kind of function can uh, produce such uh, behavior? Uh, to answer this question, we have to go to the next level of the hyperasymptotics, which is the second level. Uh, and for that, we need second hyperterminants. Uh, these are uh, natural double integral generalizations of the first one uh, with more parameters. So let nm be real numbers greater than one, sigma rho elements uh, on C hat, such that their phase uh, is not equal uh, modulo two pi. Then the second hyperterminant uh, is defined in this uh, way 
again, uh, when sigma z uh, is on the principal sheet and by analytic continuation elsewhere. Uh, for us, the interesting case will actually be when these two single and sigma and rho uh, are the same. So we need a definition uh, for the case that the arguments are equal modulo 2 pi. In that case, uh, we define the function as a limiting case. Um, so I choose the integration contour uh, so that the uh, pole here is on the left-hand side uh, of the S contour. And I will take this to be the definition in this uh, critical case. Okay, <clears throat> so iterating Boyd's uh, remainder formula uh, leads to the second uh, hyperasymptotic expansion. This is for the remainder of the remainder of the gamma function. Uh, now with this new uh, truncation scheme, but again, the terms in the re-expansion, uh, capital K is kept fixed. And in this case, we again have uh, proper estimates for the error term and they are of the correct order. And I color this uh, F2 function blue because this will govern the uh, Stokes phenomenon or the high order Stokes phenomenon um, on the positive imaginary axis. Uh, these uh, other three uh, will be negligible. In the reciprocal case, uh, we have a slightly more complicated re-expansion because uh, F1 functions also appear. Uh, truncation scheme is the same. We again have uh, nice estimates. Uh, and in this case, the Stokes phenomenon is uh, controlled by uh, two hyperterminants, an F1 function and F2 function. This is not... Uh, surprising because uh, you remember the Stokes phenomenon doesn't happen. Uh, so there must be something that kills the effect of the F2 function and that is this uh, F1 function. Okay, the last ingredient that we need a, is an estimate, uh, an over uh, berry type estimate for the F2 function. Uh, note that we are interested in the case that the singulants uh, are equal and these two parameters uh, uh, are having uh, roughly the same size. And uh, this is the uh, first result uh, that gives uh, us the asymptotic approximation of this function. So the notation is uh, exactly the same. You have already seen everything. Again, we normalize the function. We can have a small perturbation. And in this case, uh, the behavior at leading order is described by an error function and an error function squared with a slightly different uh, argument. But it's uh, nevertheless similar to the F1 function case. And the region of validity uh, is exactly the same. And just to show that these hyperterminants with the mixed uh, singulants uh, are not uh, contributing much. I established another uh, formula uh, for this F2 function when the second singulant uh, is multiplied by e to the plus minus i, uh, then it is found that uh, the size of this function is the same as the error term uh, of this asymptotics. So these functions will indeed not contribute much at least at leading order. Okay, so if you apply these uh, estimates in the second level hyperasymptotics, uh, we end up with these um, approximations, uh, very clean ones. So the next exponentials uh, multiplied by the first two terms of the series, uh, and then the approximate Stokes multiplier take these forms, and you can check the values. Uh, it grows from almost zero uh, up to three over eight and then one. This one from zero up to one over eight and then uh, down to zero again. Uh, so this is the approximate functional form that describes the high order Stokes phenomenon uh, for these exponentials. And then this procedure can be continued. Uh, so in general, uh, we go to the nth level of the hyperasymptotic expansion. And then for that, we need uh, 
the mth hyperterminant, it used the natural generalization. So an m folded integral. Again, we have a constraint on uh, neighboring uh, singulants. Again, we will need the critical case when all the singulants are the same. And I define it as a limiting case. Again, uh, the, pole sh the pole should be on the left-hand side uh, of the corresponding contour. And then we need uh, asymptotic uh, approximation uh, for these functions um, in a specific case, at least. And I hope I have some time to tell you the story behind this. So I was looking at this problem many years ago. Uh, it was motivated by a question of John King. Uh, and I found this uh, asymptotics for the F2 function at that time. Uh, I was a postdoc uh, with Adri in Edinburgh. And I showed this result to Adri and the derivation. Uh, which he was able to generalize it to the F3 and the F4 function, I believe. Uh, but the number of identities and manipulations that he needed uh, to prove the corresponding asymptotics was growing exponentially with respect to M. Uh, and there was no, no clear way to write down a general uh, proof for the nth case. Uh, so we felt that there must be another way uh, to do this. And then uh, exactly five years ago, there was a meeting in Santa Barbara uh, where Adri showed uh, these uh, results to uh, Chris Howells. Uh, and then Chris, uh, motivated by this uh, problem, uh, Chris formulated a surprising uh, conjecture involving the hyperterminants. Um, and uh, this is the conjecture itself. So we take a formal power series in T and the coefficients are uh, given by F1 hyperterminants, uh, certain F1 hyperterminants. The variables are Z, capital N and sigma, K is, K is the running index. And Chris claims that if you take the exponential of this formal power series, expand it in powers of T, then the coefficient of t to the m in the result must be this fn uh, hyperterminant, where all the ns are the same, all the sigmas, the singulants are the same. Uh, how could he come up with such a uh, identity? Uh, well, it comes from the hyperasymptotics of the comparing the hyperasymptotics of the low gamma function and the gamma function. Uh, apologize to Chris for not showing his uh, picture on the slide. Uh, and then some years later, uh, I, well, at that time I was trying to prove this conjecture, but uh, I didn't succeed. And then uh, some years later, I went back to it. And at that time I was successful. Um, and here I formulate the uh, precise statement. Uh, so this formal series does not converge for all n uh, sigma and z. So I needed a, a version that is uh, that has no converg convergence uh, problems. And for that, uh, what we do is we expand uh, this side, uh, formally in powers of t, collect the coefficients uh, of t to the n. Uh, then this is what we obtain exactly. And then Chris is claimed that this uh, huge object must be uh, this FM uh, hyperterminant function. Here this pi M uh, index uh, runs through other partitions of M into non-negative parts. Uh, so over all non-negative integer solutions, K1, K2, up to Kn uh, of such uh, an equation. And why is this conjecture important? It's because uh, it uh, gave me a way to prove the asymptotics of uh, the required hyperterminants uh, for all M. And this is the asymptotic result. Uh, 
it was enough to consider the hyperterminant where all the sigmas are the same. All the ends are the same, except the last one can be perturbed by an integer again. There is a normalization and uh, the rest of the notation is already, uh, should be familiar to you. So this time we have powers of products of sums of complementary error functions with the C function again, uh, plus uh, remainder. Uh, everything is the same, same region of validity. And uh, for example, if M equals one, then this reduces to the uh, Barry over formula. If M equals two, then it reduces to, to the formula I showed you uh, before. Okay. Uh, we have about 10 minutes. Uh, let me try to tell you quickly a sketch, sketch of the proof of the conjecture. So this is the identity we would like to prove. Uh, I'm going to denote this side uh, by little f, m, z, and sigma. And then I proceed by induction on m. It is easy to check that the identity holds when m equals one. So we assume that it holds up to m minus one, uh, where m is at least two. Uh, there is a recursion formula for the coefficients uh, of the exponential of a formal power series. <laughs> if you apply that, then we end up with this identity that I defined f0 and the zero's hyperterminant to be one. And then on this side, we have the little f's uh, with this index up to m minus one. So for that, we know that the conjecture by induction uh, hypothesis is true. So we can replace them uh, by the hyperterminants. And then uh, the main idea after this is to replace z by z to the e to the minus two pi i everywhere. Uh, then on this side, we use the known connection formula between Riemann sheets uh, for the f1 and the higher f functions. And there will be lots of cancellations. And in the end, we end up with this very clean result. Uh, and we also have to use the induction hypothesis once more uh, with m minus one. So we end up with this nice connection formula for fm. And then from this point, there are at least two ways to finish the proof. Uh, one is to obtain an integral formula for Fm using a Cauchy theorem and a kind of cauchy heine trick. Or that this formula basically tells us the discontinuity uh, on the negative axis uh, of this function. And that will give us a representation for Fm that shows that it's exactly the required hyperterminant. Another way is to use uh, different estimates for hyperterminants and combine it with uh, Liouville's theorem uh, on entire functions. Okay, let me finish uh, by showing you some uh, work in progress. So this is work in progress with uh, Chris Howers, uh, John King and uh, Adriol de Dahaus. Uh, here I show you a simplified version of uh, our upcoming result. Uh, so we look at the smoothing of the higher order Stokes phenomenon in a more general setting, uh, but this time only for the F2 case. So the new thing compared to the previous one is that uh, the absolute value of the single ends need not to be the same. They point towards the same direction, modulo two pi, but uh, the absolute value can be different. And again, with a certain normalization, we find found this uh, approximation. This is actually a simplified version. Uh, our result is a bit more general than this. Uh, you can play with the phases of the single ones. Uh, here, the complementary error function appears, uh, but also a new function, which has two arguments uh, divided by this semicolon. Uh, I will show you what it is in a moment. Uh, and we have a version when uh, the single ends uh, are pointing in different direction. Then the behavior is described by an F1 function times uh, a complementary error function. So it's much simpler. Now this new uh, function, two variable complementary error function is defined in this way. So it's a generalization of the complementary error functions, uh, error function. Uh, a similar function appears 
in the literature uh, and it's called Owens T function. So this is closely related to that function. Some specific values uh, when lambda is zero, then this is just the error complementary error function when lambda is one. Uh, this is uh, one half of the square. This is what we can use in the case of the gamma function. Uh, and if one is interested in on what happens on the Stokes line, uh, that is when the argument uh, of the function, the first argument is zero, uh, then it can be expressed in terms of uh, an inverse tangent of the reciprocal of lambda. Uh, and with that, I would like to finish my talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm surprised that you can give this whole talk without using the word resurgence because you use it everywhere. But so there are some questions here. Let me start here. A very nice talk. Um, I'm wondering in the case of the gamma function where uh, you show that Dingle's final rule breaks down. Uh, couldn't we reconcile your uh, asymptotics with Dingle's final rule by moving the Stokes line by an exponentially small amount? How would you move the Stokes line? Uh, so you create a different function. No, simply to assume that the Stokes line is not at uh, pi over 2, but pi over 2 shifted by a something very small, and then that would very slightly shift the argument of the error function smoothing. I was wondering if this could not account, at least for the gamma function, uh, some of uh, you know, the misbehavior, so to speak, that you have. Well, I believe the, 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 by the definition of Stokes line, it's fixed, but there is a, at least at each level in the smoothing, there is a phase when it is one uh, half uh, because it has to grow up to one. So there will be a phase when the value is one half. But here the problem is that uh, you can do the smoothing one at a time because for each sub exponential, you need to choose a different uh, truncation scheme. Uh, so, unlike in the case of the log gamma, it's not possible to smooth uh, all the exponentials at the same time. You can do it then one by one. Uh, so, what I can say is that for each of them, there is a phase. Uh, for the gamma function uh, when the value of the multiplier is, uh, is about one half. Um, hello, um, thanks for the interesting talk. Uh, I was wondering if these formulas that you have for Fn uh, with scaling uh, variables, if you could interpret that as a product of Laplace transform of simple objects and then look at the convolution and thereby get the asymptotics, yeah. So I if you look at the formula here, so, uh, 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 well, let's see. Uh, um, yeah, oh, yeah, so maybe I misread that. All right, uh, I'll pro probably uh, have to think about the, the form that you showed me. All right, thank you. Yeah. I mean, j just a, a little historical comment for amusement. Uh, very much of what you uh, described uh, was uh, related to the gamma function. And as Chris and I wrote uh, a, a few years ago, it was the gamma function which was the first series shown to be factorially divergent. And this was by Thomas Bayes in 1747. Uh, in those days publications of papers were slow, and his paper wasn't published till 14 years later. But in the meantime, Euler had published much more extensive work on divergent series. But still, 
uh, Bayes' argument, based on the recurrence relation for the coefficients in the Stirling formula, uh, is the first example known to me where uh, a, 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 an asymptotic series was known to be factorially divergent. And it, it's very amusing because here today we heard the ultimate, uh, in, uh, as far as I know, the ultimate development of the asymptotics of the uh, of the gamma function. So it goes back a very long way. The same Thomas Bayes, who, who, who is much better known for his probability uh, rule, but this is a quite different thing. So just a, just a little historical comment. Are there any more questions? If not, let's thank Gregor again. <laughs> And we are perfectly on time for lunch. <laughs>